Hey geeks, it's 2020, so world news remains crazy. Before we begin, hit the subscribe button below, click the notification bell, follow us, and please like this video. 161 former national security officials who served under both Democrat and Republican administrations, including under Trump, sent a letter urging the government to recognize Joe Biden as president-elect or risk undermining our national security. Here's the deal. By law, the General Services Administration, which is probably a government agency you've never heard of and now never want to, needs to officially recognize the president-elect in order for a transition to begin. That step allows Biden's team access to government buildings and staff, it kicks off the security clearance process, and most critically, it gives them access to information and intelligence on our most pressing national security issues. But the head of this agency, who's a Trump appointee, has refused to take this step, and now NATSEC nerds are arguing that a delay poses a serious risk to national security. I asked the Glorious Geeks what you all thought, and 92% of you agree. I went through a transition before, from President Bush to Obama, and it was a no-drama experience, and here's why that matters. You know when you start a new job and it takes a while to get your sea legs? You kind of ease in the first few weeks, sit back and listen, and really it takes like six months before you get the real hang of things? Yeah, you don't have time for that in national security. You walk in the door, you drink from a fire hose, and you hit the ground running. And that's how it's supposed to be. The work continues, the mission continues, just the people at the top come in and they can't afford to learn as they go. They need to walk in there already knowing what the key problems are, what things are in train, and what staff they'll need. The officials who signed this letter explained the 9-11 Commission, which was a bipartisan initiative, found that the delay in approving the transition from Presidents Clinton to Bush back in 2000 led to a six-month delay in staffing Bush's national security teams, which left the U.S. more vulnerable to a foreign attack. Because of this, the Commission concluded that transitions should seek to avoid disrupting national security policymaking as much as possible. So basically, it's no joke. And it's angering because the president's delay is about his own ego instead of the safety of the American people. And yet we're the ones who could suffer. I'm so heated, my hair dye is gonna start running. I swear you cannot make this shit up. OMW, I am particularly excited to talk about this story because it is straight out of Hollywood. News broke last week that the US and Israel worked together to assassinate a senior Al Qaeda leader in Iran earlier this year. The U.S. gave intelligence to the Israelis on where this dude was, and Israeli agents in Tehran carried out the killing by gunning him down an alley. Not only did they kill him, but they did it on August 7th, which is the anniversary of the 1998 bombings of the U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania, which Al-Qaeda planned. Do you have any idea how badass this is? And the fact that they were able to coordinate it on the anniversary of a major Al-Qaeda terrorist attack is poetic justice. The death of that Al-Qaeda leader definitely serves a blow to the terrorist organization. Now you may ask yourself why an Al-Qaeda leader would choose to be in Iran, given that Iran's government is technically against the terrorist group. While Iran has never supported Al-Qaeda, Iran overlooks their behavior because it likes any effort that helps destabilize the Middle East, because that in turn gives Iran more leverage in the region. This actually comes amid other Iran-related news that just broke. Last week, President Trump asked whether he could strike Iran's main nuclear site after learning that there'd been a significant increase in Iran's nuclear stockpile. Well, thankfully, the Vice President, Secretary of State, Acting Defense Secretary, and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff all warned him that striking this facility could end up sparking a broader conflict. The issues in Iran are basically one big <laughs> sandwich. These are real tough problems for any administration to grapple with. That said, it doesn't make sense for the US President to target Iran's nuclear stockpile unless we're genuinely ready for war. And it definitely doesn't make sense for an outgoing President to be the one to do that unless there's an imminent threat, which isn't the case right now. Still, it's ugly and dangerous, and we all need to keep a close eye on Iran. War has broken out in Ethiopia, and it matters because it's quickly turning into a humanitarian crisis and could end up sucking the whole place into conflict. Ethiopia is in the Horn of Africa, and it's landlocked and surrounded by a number of other countries. It's actually an interesting and beautiful country with a very rich history. And by the way, Ethiopian food is among my favorite. That's not why you should care, though. So here's the background. Fighting broke out there two weeks ago after Ethiopia's government accused a political party that controls the northern part of Ethiopia, called Tigray, of holding an illegal election and attacking a military base to steal weapons. So Ethiopia's prime minister sent the military to fight forces there that are loyal to this political party. In just two weeks, 30,000 refugees have fled to neighboring Sudan, and the UN says it doesn't have enough resources to take care of them. Hundreds of thousands of people in this area have now been displaced, and getting aid in has been nearly impossible. So let's walk it back so I can explain why this is happening. The political party that rules this area is called the Tigray People's Liberation Front. It used to be a dominant party in the government, but ever since the prime minister took over, it's become the underdog, and so they kind of hate that. The prime minister came to power in 2018, and he has done some good things, like make peace with neighboring Eritrea, which ended two decades of war and landed him a Nobel Peace Prize. But since he came to power, ethnic divisions in Ethiopia have only risen. 
The Prime Minister delayed elections this year because of COVID, but the Tigray People's Liberation Front went ahead with their own elections in their region anyway. So this is what led to the current violence there. And it's a risky business because it could draw Eritrea in since they hate this political party too. It could also get in the way of Ethiopia's efforts to resolve border disputes with Somalia and Djibouti. Not to be confused with my booty. Most critically, it could end up causing civilian suffering on a large scale. It's all a cluster and the last thing we need in 2020. So I'm hoping things there calm down soon. <laughs> Over the last few weeks, hundreds of thousands across Poland have taken to the streets to protest against the right-wing Polish government. The protest started in response to a decision by Poland's constitutional court that would have severely restricted access to abortion. As it is, abortion in Poland is only allowed in three scenarios. In the case of rape or incest, if the mother's life is in danger, or if the fetus suffers from severe congenital defects. But the court decided to strike out that third reason, meaning that if the child has serious life-threatening conditions, an abortion would be out of the question. So both Polish women and men hit the streets in what has been called the women's strike. The government has delayed pushing this through, but the protests have continued and it now kind of looks like a revolution is starting. Right-wing nationalist hooligans who are condoned by their leaders have tried to rough up protesters and cause trouble, but they haven't been able to shake these protests. The thing that the media is missing is that this was kind of the last straw. Yes, it was the abortion issue that made people hit the street, but ultimately this is about a population screaming against a far-right populist government and its effort to walk back Poland's freedoms. For example, this summer, the Polish government decided to leave the Istanbul Convention, which is a treaty that works to prevent and combat violence against women. The president himself also campaigned on an anti-LGBTQ platform, which has increased homophobia across the country. Now the Polish government, along with its tyrannical buddy in Hungary, are holding the European Union hostage by blocking a stimulus package to help rescue Europe's economy. Why? Because it requires EU members to uphold rule of law standards, like an independent judiciary, which both Poland and Hungary have torn down. Why the EU lets Poland and Hungary get away with this behavior is beyond me. If they don't twist their arms and tell them they need to abide by the EU's democratic values or risk losing their membership, they'll just continue behaving like thugs. For these reasons, the Polish government is on my shit list this week. In 2018, Saudi women were granted the freedom to drive. This after a long and painful road taken on by a group of Saudi activists. And yet following this, the Saudi government jailed a number of the female activists who had advocated for this cause. One of them is Lujain al hathul who is crushing it as one of the most prominent and outspoken women human rights defenders in Saudi Arabia. She's known for her role in the Women to Drive movement and in opposing the Saudi male guardianship system, which requires women to get permission from men for basically everything. Before women were allowed to drive in Saudi Arabia, Lujain proudly defied the ban and as a result was arrested and released several times. At one point, she was kidnapped in the UAE and forced back to Saudi Arabia and jailed. She's now been detained since May 2018, when the Saudi government pursued a wide crackdown on feminists and arrested several women's rights activists who have since been horrifically tortured, threatened, and harassed while in prison. I don't need to detail for you the kind of torture Lujain has suffered. I need you to remember her name. I need you to call for her release. Lujain's family has worked tirelessly to get her out, and at one point, they said the Saudi government would let her go if she agreed to make a public statement saying she had not been tortured, but she refused to confirm such a lie. A few weeks ago, Lujain went on a hunger strike to protest against a lack of regular contact with her parents, and her family says they're very worried about her deteriorating health. The reason I'm sharing this story is because it is critical that people around the world call for her release, especially this week. Tomorrow, Saturday, November 20th, Saudi Arabia is hosting a virtual G20 summit. And while these assholes sit at their desks and talk about how they can improve their economic ties, this woman and others are actively being tortured in Saudi prisons. No. Our government and others should demand that Saudi Arabia release Lujain and other female activists, and they should do it at this summit. Even authoritarian governments can bend to public pressure. So please join me in sharing her story and calling for her release with the hashtag Free Lujain. It's been an intense week, but I promise next week will be filled with good news. Yeah, that's probably not gonna happen. Please hit the subscribe button and like this video. Leave me a comment or question and please follow Oh My World and Me on Instagram and Twitter. Stay fabulous, geeks.